I want to delve into now whiteness, right? You brought it up, Sarah, and you say, you, you know, you say, and they're comfortable with racism. It isn't just for me about their comfort with racism. It's the desire to use these networks and these platforms in order to secure white supremacy, mm-hmm. to secure, mm-hmm. to embed it, right? To continue to indoctrinate it in every way that they can. When we are looking at, you know, the fight uh, at K through 12 school level in terms of the curriculum that they have. And then we look at what the media was supposed to be, which is the fourth estate in terms of the responsibility to educate, right? Young adults and adults about their responsibility as citizens. We are saying to you at, from the K to grave level that we are about indoctrinating white supremacy because that is how we hold on to our power. That is how we hold on to our wealth. And so my question for you is, you know, I go particularly hard on white women all the time because one of the things that is coming up, you know, now is that white women have lost abortion, right? And I want to make it clear when I say white women, because for many black women and brown women in red states, that was just a paper, a a, a, a paper promise, right, is what Roe mm-hmm. v. Wade was for them. And so now that white women have lost the ability to have an abortion and uh, South Carolina state legislature, women, the three women in the state legislature are like, oh my God, even in cases of rape and incest, these white men don't want us to have an abortion. It's just like, yeah, wake up. Right. But you were okay. Mm-hmm. So long as it was black and brown women. So my question is, you know, what is it about white women right? That allows them to be able to have this disassociative way of being, right? That until their own lives are directly affected, now it's like, oh my goodness, they're going to pay at the polls. And I'm like, bitch, where were you in 2020? Oh, that's right. 56% voted for Donald Trump. Where were you in 2016 when one of your own was running against a misogynist pig? Oh, that's right. You chose him over her. And so I'm just wondering, what do you think is in the psyche of these quote unquote conservative white women that allows them to disassociate from reality in the way that they do? And Sarah, on yeah. behalf of democracy ish in the by the power vested in you by us, you are yes, you are you are the I correct. I, I get to be the spokesperson here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the spokesman. I mean, I think first of all, there's a deficit of empathy. There's an immorality, mm. you know, that is inexcusable regardless where you're coming from. There's also um, historical illiteracy. And I had some hope uh, in 2019 and 2020 when a lot of, um, you know, conversations about structural racism were happening and rising to the fore that p- perhaps, you know, people's minds can be swayed. That if they knew the actual history of this country, if they knew what Jim Crow was like, if they knew that slavery was not some distant part of the past, but informed decisions about how modern cities were made, about where people live, about who is funded, about who is not, that they would cultivate at least a sense of understanding and that that might lead to a sense of empathy. And then the backlash arrived and it Mm -hmm. arrived during the pandemic and it arrived during a time of uh, trauma. And what I see happening is, you know, this happens too with white men, but with white women, it's proximity to power. They've chosen to embrace proximity to power over uh, moral integrity and even over their own political self-interest because they are not going to win in the end in terms of having freedom, in terms of having rights. Theirs will be taken away next. And so they're making, I think, a very bad bet, a very uh, immoral and unpragmatic bet that if you take the side of white men, that they somehow will protect you and that the system that they're trying to create will also protect you. And it's wrong. And I, I see it too with, um, you know, with white people in general, uh, you know, where they look at Kyle Rittenhouse, for example, and they're like, oh, look what he did. You know, he went and killed two people um, because he was against black people having rights and he was rewarded from it for it. Yep. He treated like a folk hero and he got off the hook. You know, people like this idea of criminal impunity. It usually only goes to the elite ca- class. It goes to the Trumps and, you know, Manafort's and Kushner's of the world. I 
think they think that if they get in on, you know, this MAGA action, that it's transferable. And then women look at the men and they think, oh, it'll transfer to us. And that is the message that this group of people is sending those voters is, you know, you too can get away with anything. You can say anything, you can behave in whatever abhorrent way you want. We have a long history in America of white people, you know, behaving in abhorrent ways, having it documented, photographed, uh, you know, presented to the message and, and no repercussions, no legal repercussions and not the kind of ostracization that I think someone should experience mm-hmm. if they're, say, witnessing a lynching and just having a picnic nearby. You know, that's been the American uh, experience. That is what they want to bring us back to. Um, and so it's really up to those individual women to reject that, but they're putting out incentives for them not to. And so, you know, some of that is just, you know, I condemn it. And some of it is like, wake up, like in your own self-interest, they are going to screw you over too. You know, I live in Missouri. I've lost my bodily autonomy, uh, you know, and, and as you said correctly, black women in Missouri have been fighting for that right for a long time and been struggling for equal access to reproductive care for a long time. And now it has hit uh, everybody. And there is this sort of shock. The shock shouldn't be there. I hope it does wake people up again. I, I don't know, though, because there's these competing narratives that are that are aimed at this audience. Uh, Sarah, you are now the leader of all white women in America. <laughs> oh, God, I, no. wish. I wish. I <laughs> wish. <laughs> Go forth and proselytize. I, I resigned. I'm stepping down. <laughs> May your reign be fruitful. May your crown and jewels <laughs> not be embedded with uh, those who were formerly subjugated by the British right. monarchy. Uh, you know, a lot of these white women like to participate in coups, and I think they will participate in another one if I am appointed <laughs> to this role. So I'm going to just send you are lasting for 14 seconds as a leader of white women before <laughs> Karen snatched away her crown. Uh, Bring on the coup, baby. You're connecting the dots. You're talking about this need for proximity to power, which explains why so many white women behave in a way which uh, ultimately <laughs> removes their autonomy, but gives them protection, which also explains to me why media mm. does what it does. And the CBS mm-hmm. co-president said, oh, we think the Republicans are going to win. That's why we need access to power, right? And so we're going to be complicit uh, in the rise of a fascist movement that is eventually going to come and kill us, right? And and you're talking about this, those who have no culpability, no accountability, those who just walk freely due to whiteness, due to wealth, due to proximity of power. And as you were saying that, I just thought of Prince Andrew. And I vomited a little bit uh. in my mind. And, and the reason why I thought of Prince Andrew, it was because mm. in your book, and you mentioned him before a couple of minutes ago, an example of your thesis or an example of your ideas, I think it is articulated very well because you bring it up again and again and again, is Jeffrey Epstein. And Jeffrey Epstein is connected to Prince Andrew. For those of you who don't know, Prince Andrew allegedly, well, perhaps most Not likely. Not even allegedly. He, he paid him off. He did it. He, he, did, he, he raped a teenage girl. There you go. Had sex with minors as a pedophile. Everyone knows about it, but now he's there and you can't boo him apparently as he's, you know, this endless. No, that's, that crazy. is illegal. Not, yeah, not, can. not his crimes, but the booing. Yeah, not hanging out with a pedophile and, you know, having sex with him. But God forbid, if you're a crowd bystander, you're booing, seeing this man walk in this procession. That's, the, that's decorum and civility. You know, talking about Epstein and Andrews as an example of how the institutions, Democrats and Republicans, the wealthy, had no problem, Sarah, normalizing, dealing with, and profiting off of a known pedophile. Break that down. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he was a pedophile and he was a trafficker and he was implicated in espionage and blackmail ap- operations. And he was linked to, you know, the most elite and wealthy and powerful people in the world. Prince Andrew, uh, Ehud Barak, Trump, uh, Alan Dershowitz. I mean, the, the list is very long. And then people who weren't accused of rape um, in the context of Epstein, but who certainly knew him, like Bill Gates or Bill Clinton. Um, it's, it's a very long list. And the same is true of Ghislaine Maxwell. And yes, they knew. Um, it is mind boggling to me. You know, I, I knew about Epstein before Trump was uh, um, made president. And I kept bringing this up because Trump was sued in court. Uh, by a woman who says that he raped uh, her when she was only 13 years old and that she was a victim of the Epstein trafficking operation. And, you know, she stuck to this story for many years. She tried to hold a press conference about it. And, uh, you know, she was threatened with death threats and so was her lawyer. And they dropped um, the press conference. You know, these are very frightening people. And with 
Epstein, though, it's like he was arrested for this um, back in, I, I believe it was 2007, given this sort of uh, very loose house arrest in which he was still allowed to do whatever the hell he wanted. Uh, when that ended, he just re-entered high society and people partied with him and hung out with him and it absolutely no problem that this is a pedophile. This is a, a rapist of children who kidnaps children and gives them to other high power predators to rape. I mean, it's one of the most horrifying things you can imagine. And they did not want people to know, but more than that, they didn't want them to care. They didn't want them to think it was important. They would refer to the girls who were the victims as just trash, as disposable mm. people. And I think that that is how this particular class, uh, you know, sees a lot of people, including um, most Americans. But yeah, you know, I, I talk about him a lot because he's a, I think, a really central node in this great mystery of um, why aren't people being held accountable, which is that this is a culture of blackmail and threats and bribes and a different form of leverage than I think we are accustomed to. And, you know, th this has always been the case. You know, you see um, conspiracies like Iran-Contra, like Watergate. The Epstein operation is murkier. It's transnational. It's linked to non-state actors, linked to the mafia, um, involved, you know, arms trading and all sorts of things as well. And we've never fully gotten um, to the bottom of it, in part because of, uh, you know, Bill Barr was in charge of the DOJ when Epstein, quote unquote, committed suicide in prison. Bill Barr's father, Donald Barr, is the person who hired Epstein as a high school teacher mm. uh, and introduced him into high society in New York. Um, meanwhile, uh, Bill Barr's father, Donald Barr, was writing science fiction novels about uh, intergalactic pedophile rings. So that's just a, a wonderful coincidence. Wow. See, these stories, to me, at the least, they're very interesting, right? Like that little factoid about Bill Barr's dad. You'd think that might have made it on the news instead of the Bill Barr rehabil rehabilitation tour in which people are pretending that someone, even William Sapphire, called the cover-up general, because what he does is clean up Republican dirty crimes, is some sort of um, you know consummate statesman. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous, but they are all avoiding this because they're up to things that are creepy and evil and unpunished. And I think they want to keep it that way.